What is up everybody, Coding Jesus here. Before we start this stream, I wanna make sure that the audio is working, that everybody can hear me. So if you can hear me, put a one in the chat. If you can hear me, put a one in the chat. Let's see here. Waiting for people to either say they can hear me or they can't. There's a little delay here. Audio's fine? Okay, awesome. All right, everybody, welcome to church. Today's lesson is going to be about crafting a resume for really quant anything. So if you are here in church today on the lovely Sunday morning, then you're in the right place. Now, who is this live stream for? As I said, guys, today's live stream will be for quant anything resume construction. But most importantly, if you're a software engineer, if you are looking to make the switch into the world of software engineering, if you are looking to make a switch into the world of quantitative trading, then this will be a very, very useful session for you. Now, where are my manners? Who am I? Well, if you're new to the channel, guys, my name is Coding Jesus. I'm a quantitative developer, meaning I write programs for a proprietary trading firm that I work at um, that not only involve front-end applications, server-side applications, various algorithms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I like talking about code, cryptocurrency, software engineering, et cetera. And if you do want a question answered, for example, I see Coding Jesus, what university did you, did you go to? Make sure to put it in a super chat. I will prioritize super chats. But if I don't get in a super chat, I'm just gonna keep on talking about today's content and today's subject. Now, a lot of people message me, they email me and they say, Coding Jesus, I want a resume review, but not a lot of people can afford the amount that I charge for resume reviews. So if you're one of those people that can't afford it, would like to get a free resume review, today is the session to do it. I'm doing it for free today. All right, now why the hell am I even qualified to be giving advice on resume reviews? Well, I've actually had three people as a result of my professional advice given to them via my consulting and mentorship sessions, land positions at top tier firms like Amazon, like uh, IMC and other firms. So people that wanted to break into quant trading have been able to do so as a result of my advice. So there's a lot of haters and detractors out there. We're not gonna give them the time of day. They don't have the qualifications to even speak towards it because to be frank, they've had zero people that have made it into the industry as a result of their advice. So this is free advice. If you like it, take it. If you don't like it, you can click the little red X button at the top of your screen. But without further ado, I think there are a lot of people that are going to want to hear my advice and to listen to what I have to say with regards to quant development. Now, chat looks a little dead. Is chat alive? Am I still live here? Am I still online? Is everybody still okay? Is everybody there? Church. Are... Is church alive or is church dead? I mean, uh, you guys are either super attentive or everybody just disappeared. All right, somebody's alive, somebody's alive. Bro love from India. Okay guys, like I said, I'm gonna be talking about resume construction for the quant dev, the quant researcher, and the quant trader. Each one will have different content, but regardless of the content, the actual construction of the way the content is presented to a recruiter, to a manager, to an interviewer will be the exact same way. So the structure of this presentation, guys, the structure of this live stream, I'm gonna be describing how to go ahead and write a good resume, what sections you need, how you should lay them out, I'm gonna be describing the do's and the don'ts. So we're gonna be looking at a resume that I think is a big don't. And we're going to have people coming onto the live stream. So we'll have a Google Meets uh, in just a second. And they will be sharing their resume. A couple of people have emailed me their resume and we will be going over it together. So if you're one of those people out there that have sent me their, their resume, make sure to jump on the live stream. I'll be sending a Google Meets link when I do indeed get to that part so we can review it together. All right, everybody. All right, everybody. Let's start with the fundamental point. And once again, if you have a question, make sure to put it in super chat. The fundamental point of resume construction. What is the point or the purpose of constructing a resume? The point or the purpose is to highlight your strengths to the interviewer such that you will, in their eyes, seem like the perfect candidate for the job. Now, this requires understanding a couple of things. It requires understanding what industry you're going to apply to. And it also under requires understanding what position you are applying for, all right? I see a lot of people trying to apply, for example, for the quant trading space, writing about how great they are of web developers. 
There's a massive disconnect there. So in order to even start crafting a resume, you need to understand what industry you're applying for and what people in the industry are looking for. All right. When you're thinking about becoming a quant developer, for example, you're, you need to do research into what quant developers do. And quant developers often code in C++ and or C Sharp or Python. So if you're writing a resume and one of the main highlights of your resume is a web dev project you did, you know, three years ago, that's not a relevant piece of information to become a quant developer. That's not something that you're going to want to put on your resume. So first of all, do industry research. And guys, you'd be very surprised at the amount of people that simply do not do research. They send out their resumes for whatever industry, assuming that you know they have a cookie cutter, one size fits all resume. And it doesn't work that way. You have to tailor your resume to the industry and you need to know what you're applying for. Now, how do you know what you're applying for in the sense of how do you know what the recruiter or employer or manager, whatever you want to call them, is looking for in your resume? The best way that I go about doing this is I go to the job description of the actual position I'm applying for. And you know, there are hundreds of job descriptions for quantitative developers, but I get a sense of what they're looking for. And I use their language when I construct my resume. For example, somebody that's looking, they're looking for somebody that is, uh, owns their work or owns their projects, right? So you want to kind of use that language in and around your resume, somebody that has experience in C++ or C Sharp. So you know you want to use those buzzwords or those language buzzwords on your resume. Somebody that's familiar with a Linux environment, right? So you want to use those words in your resume. You really want to cater your resume to what the employer is looking for. That is the point and purpose of the resume. The point is not to say how passionate you are. Passion is something that's displayed, not stated. A lot of people will say how passionate they are about a position, but when it comes to actually doing the work, they might not be as passionate as they've said so. So that's just a simple example where employers won't look at what you say or write on your resume, rather they will actually look at what you've done and we'll get into that in a second in regards to the content of your resume. That's the purpose section. Does everybody have a clear understanding of the purpose section of a resume to highlight your strengths as to why you are the ideal candidate for the position? That is the purpose. It is Sunday and we are alive again. That is correct. All right, guys, now that everybody understands the purpose of a resume, let's actually discuss the design behind a resume because I think the design is very important. I've met a lot of people that are very brilliant software engineers, but they weren't able to make it into the space because their resume simply wasn't designed the way it should be to communicate their value to an employer. All right, how do we go about designing a resume? Well, there's a couple of do's and don'ts. You need to understand that a resume is a piece of real estate. It is a piece of real estate and every single white space is important because every single indent in white space is space you are not using to communicate your value to an employer. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes some people will have columns in their resume and those columns will have a lot of white space. Sometimes people will have massive indentations on the side of their resume and so their resume is kind of squished in the center and they're missing out on a lot of valuable real estate. Another thing that's important when it comes to design is font. Are you using Arial, are you using Helvetica, are you using some random font that nobody really understands? Keep it to Arial and Times New Roman. That's what you'd be focusing on. Another thing that's extremely important is how the manager's eyes work down the resume. And that's exactly what you want them to do. You want their eyes to work down the resume. I see people that have like sections split up of their resume and it looks like you're reading a manga and you're like jumping side to side and up and down and you know, diagonal cross. That's not how you want to write a resume. You want to have distinct sections, which we'll get to in a second, starting from the top, working all the way to the bottom, right? Make it easy for them. The next thing that you do not want to do is you do not want to have graphics on your resume. Guys, I've seen senior software engineers send me their resumes and it looks, to, to be frank, like comic books because they have like little clip art graphics of stars and they're rating their skills on a scale from one to five and they, have like little stars that you get in kindergarten and you put on your like little sheet card that you did well this week. Try to make sure that your resume does not look like a comic book. You don't want that to happen. All right, another thing that you should be mindful of is recruiters get piles and piles of resumes, okay? You're one person in some massive stack of resumes. Now, some people might try to stand out by adding color to their resume as though this is like a coloring exercise. It's not a coloring exercise, guys. Make sure your resume is black and white and it's easily easy to read, 
right? That brings me to my second point with regards to employers having thousands of resumes to read. They don't have time. You might think that you're very important. Heck, everybody thinks that they're important. But a recruiter has eight hours in a day or a internal HR or a manager, you know, any replace any position. The person that's looking at your resume, they have eight hours in the day, guys. And most of that is not going to be spent looking at your resume, maybe only an hour, if it will, for new applications or positions. If you have a resume that's like four pages, no, okay, don't do that. Don't have a four page resume where you're like storytelling, you're writing an essay, just don't do that. Now, a lot of people also ask about cover letters. I think cover letters are fine for certain industries. In investment banking, a cover letter was a requirement, but in the world of quant development, quant trading, quant research, I've never actually seen a resume that's had a cover letter. I'm not saying it's not a requirement, it might be a requirement, but for most firms, I haven't seen cover letter as a requirement. That might change, but no need to write a cover letter. Focus on having a very clear and concise resume that highlights your strengths for the recruiter, employer, whatever you want to call it. Another thing that I want to talk about is you want to move the person's eyes towards critical sections as they're walking down. All right. So when you have sections like experience, pet projects, etc., make sure to bold those sections. All right. You want them to be easily distinguishable. Another thing with regards to design guys is you guys are software engineers. But for some reason, you guys don't know how to hyperlink URLs in text. When you're sending a resume, guys, it's digital. It's entirely digital. So when the person opens it up, they can click on a hyperlink that you've linked inside a piece of text somewhere on your resume. I see resumes that have like 400 links on them. What are you expecting me to click? If I'm going to be reading a bullet point and you say, you know, you worked on XYZ using XYZ software, and you think for whatever reason that what you worked on, let's say it's a, a publication, is something I should read, then you should link it. You should hyperlink the link to that publication in the bullet point. Don't put it at the bottom somewhere or at the top beside your name, etc. Another thing in terms of design, guys, regardless of how you structure the sections on your resume, what you always want to have is at the top of your resume, your name. Now, don't put your name in like size 100 font so that people will read your name. All right. Put your name in the middle, bolded, maybe a little bigger than the traditional font size of the rest of your resume, but just have your name on the left-hand side, have your number on the right-hand side, have your email. That's how they're going to contact you. Those are the means by which they can contact you. Don't have, you know, your LinkedIn's and your Facebook's and your Instagram's and your League of Legends username. All right. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of space. And also don't put your home address. Nobody's going to come and visit you. I don't understand why people put their home address somewhere. Um, it's weird. It's like, I'm not going to come visit you. I don't care where you live. And it might actually work against you if the recruiter or employer is biased against you. All right. Or against where you live because X, Y, Z reason, who knows? There are a lot of crazies out there. So don't put your home address where you live. That's not important. All right, guys, let's get into the actual content of the resume. So we understand the general design tips and tricks, and now we want to get into the content of the resume. I see somebody posted a good question here, GitHub. GitHub is fine. GitHub is good. Don't go overboard with GitHub. If you put a GitHub link, make sure it is hyperlinked in the word GitHub on the top right of your resume. You'll have phone number, name, email, some sort of separator, some sort of del delimiter, and then the word GitHub hyperlinked. Don't put like a four, 400 line link to uh, to your GitHub. Is the advice for getting quant developer internships at quant firms the same as getting full-time quant developer roles? It's very similar. It's very similar, John Doe. Um, very, very similar. The only thing is the seniority of the actual position. So the advice is indeed the same. Guys, we have 77 viewers and we have 19 likes. This is unacceptable. Unacceptable. We need 50% engagement. I'm going to wait till we have 40 likes. I'm not going to speak until we have 40 likes because um, unacceptable guys. I mean, this is, you know, this is uh, quality stuff. I'm telling you guys all for free. We need the likes up guys. Likes, 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 smash those likes. 40 likes guys. I'm not continuing until we get 40 likes. 
Guys, and if you want your questions answered, super chat. Super chat. Two more likes, guys. There we go. All right. We've hit 50% engagement, guys. Try to keep it at 50% engagement because that's my minimum requirement here. All I'm asking for is 50% engagement. I'm not asking for money or anything. 50% engagement, and we will continue. All right, guys. Now we're getting onto the content section. This is probably one of the most important sections beyond design. Now, design is extremely important, and design will actually be used to pretty much discard or continue reading your resume. If your design is total garbage, nobody's going to read your resume. If you have three pieces of paper, like I said, it doesn't matter how skilled you are, they're throwing it out. They have hundreds of applications. So design is what will either filter you out completely or allow you, or allow the recruiter rather, to keep reading over your resume. Okay, guys, you keep asking questions, that's great, but if you're not in a super chat, I'm gonna continue with my, my content. All right, so how do we have, or how do we structure the actual content of a resume? There's a couple of things before we get into the actual detailed points here. The first thing is you need to decide on a date formatting consistency. Guys, you have no idea how many times I see people where they say June 2020, and then they'll say DEC, like December 2020. Keep a date formatting. Even these little things, guys, will really help you make sure the, the employer recruiter keeps reading your resume. Because if you have no attention to detail, you can't even format your dates correctly. Are you really going to be able to write multi-threaded code that requires extreme attention to detail? I would argue that you probably can't because if you make those small mistakes, it's very likely that those mistakes will be persisting throughout your time at that firm. So stuff as simple as date formatting, pick a date format, all right? Now, a lot of people ask me what sections should be on there and which sections are more, most important. This is where we get to the real crux of the issue. All right, guys, if you are an intern or somebody that doesn't have previous programming experience or previous formal programming experience, which section should you have first? Chat, do you know which section you should have first? Do you know which sections you should have first? If you are somebody that's either applying for an internship or you don't have previous experience in the industry, apart from your name as the header, of course, we'll get to that in a second, what should be your first section? I'm seeing somebody saying projects, what else? Does anybody have any other ideas? Projects might be one. There's experience, there's additional interests, there's education. What do people think? Education, projects, okay, hmm. Mm -hmm. Work experience, but you don't have any work experience because you're an intern or you're applying for an internship or you are somebody that is trying to break into the industry. All right, guys, let me tell you, a lot of people actually got this wrong. Two, three people got it right so far. A lot of people are saying the wrong thing. The first thing that should be up there is projects. Now, why should projects be up there? Why should you have a section titled pet projects? All right, why should it be there? Well, if you're applying for an internship or you are new to the space, you need a way to distinguish yourself from everybody else that has a degree. Let's say you're applying for an internship. You have a computer science degree. All right, you have a computer science degree, but so too do thousands of other people that are applying to this, this given field. And you'd be surprised how many people don't have a degree, right? So in order to differentiate yourself, you need to have a pet project section that highlights what you previously worked on. Now, somebody previously asked me about GitHub. You can have your GitHub at the top right corner of your resume, but you can also have it right near the title of your pet project section. So pet projects in bold, brackets, GitHub, and you're going to hyperlink the GitHub there. We'll take a look at an actual good resume in just a second, but I'm just working you guys through the concepts, getting you primed for it. All right, guys, pet project section. How many projects should you have there? And what should be the quality of the projects? Well, in terms of projects, you do not want to talk about homework assignments. All right, you do not want to talk about things that everybody else has done. You want to talk about projects that you've done outside and beyond school that are relevant for the position. So for example, if this is a C++ quant developer position, you don't want to talk about how you made a second version of Neopets or you made some sort of plugins for some sort of video game. Yes, concepts there might be relevant, but you want to make sure if you can that the project that you're selecting is indeed most relevant for the actual position. All right, guys, what is another section that people have on their resume? So we wanna start off with our pet project section if we're trying to break into the space 
or for an intern. All right, let's first talk about the other sections before we talk about how to then organize them. We have education, we have additional skills and interests, we have work experience, we have, so I kind of blanked out there. We have pet projects, work experience, education, additional interests. We really have four sections here that we're going to be talking about. Now, if you're a super senior software engineer, you don't need to lead with your pet project section. And, for, and to be frank, nobody's probably gonna care about it. It's only if you're new to the industry or you're trying to break into it. Now, why is it important if you try to break into it? Well, you wanna differentiate yourself with people that have degrees in the space. So therefore, you guys have pet, pet project section. All right. Let's talk about the next section that people might have. They might have an education section. Now, what the hell should be in their education section? Well, you should have the school that you've gone to, of course, and what should be in the bullet points? In the bullet points, you should have three primary things if you know them. Your GPA, any awards or accomplishments that you've had, and any scholarships that you've been given. Now, the education section is actually not as important as you think. Once you've graduated school, people care about what you know and what you've done as opposed to what school or what piece of paper or what school has given you a piece of paper. All right, a lot of jobs that I've actually applied to, nobody's even known where the hell I've gone to school for. In fact, nobody's even asked me if I've graduated yet. Now that's an anecdote on my end, and I'm sure there are places that really do care about what school you go to, but it's not as important as a lot of people think, and therefore it shouldn't occupy a lot of real estate on your resume. Like I said, scholarships, awards, and your GPA. Now, a lot of people talk about GPA in terms of an absolute score, 3.8. But 3.8 out of what? Okay, maybe you have a 3.8 in India, but I don't know what the score is in India, right? Maybe it's out of 10. So if you have a 3.8 out of 10, I don't even know how you graduated. But regardless, you guys get my drift. There's a difference between 3.8 out of 4 or 3.8 out of 4.2. All right. That's the education section. In terms of experience, this part is going to be the driver for senior or people, senior developers or people with experience in, in the industry. But this should really be the second section on your resume if you are somebody new to the industry or you're trying to break into it. Now, what's the point of experience? The point of experience is to show that you guys might have the requisite skills or skill set to be able to make it into the industry. All right. Maybe you worked at a grocery store because you are a university graduate, but that's still important because it shows various traits that an employer will find valuable in you that they will then go ahead and harvest those skills to build you up as a software engineer. For example, you might have worked at a grocery store, but if you are able to spin that experience to talk about your ability to communicate with team members, your ability to uh, work in large teams and do so effectively, that's going to be very valuable for an employer who understands that you are just a university graduate or you don't have previous internship experience or you are trying to break into the space. So that's going to be extremely important. We'll get into how we actually qualify those bullet points in a second. But I think what's really important here, guys, is in your experience section, don't write a massive story. Don't give me some gigantic essay. We'll get a look at a bad resume in a second, but that bad resume includes like a paragraph about who they are and their life story and how they've come up from, from nothing, okay? That's not relevant to your work experience. You wanna have bullet points in each one of your work experience sections or, or each one of your work experiences and you wanna have two to three bullet points at maximum. Now, how do you structure these bullet points? That's gonna be very important. Okay, wait, we got a super chat here. In terms of pet projects, any recommendations for things to work on in terms of C++, Python that HFT quants might want to see? So guys, thank you for the super chat. Alfonso, once again, guys, if you want me to focus on your questions, we will, you'll need to post a super chat. So this is a great question. I think a lot of people out there think that if you're applying to quant dev, if you're applying to quant trading, you need some sort of massive uh, project that you built some sort of crazy system. That's entirely not what you need to do. You need to focus on simple projects. Now, how do you know what simple projects you need to focus on? Look at various finance concepts that you might think are applicable to quant dev. For example, I thought that a building a bond pricer might be applicable to the world of quant finance, and indeed it is. So one of my projects was building a bond pricer. It was a simple bond pricer. It was a C++ application with a couple of .h and .cpp files, and I was able to speak to it in the, in the actual interview and use that as a pet project on my pet project section. So don't focus on doing something insane, focus on something simple. Another idea that might come up is building some sort of server client application, a very simple server client application 
where somebody might submit a new order. Um, for example, they might type in a new order, the instrument and the quantity it will be sent to the server and maybe the server will store it in a database somewhere. It doesn't have to be some very complex matching engine. It just needs to be something simple that might be applicable to the world of quantitative development. So I hope that answers your question. I hope that was good enough. All right. Another super chat from Tyrone. Thank you, Tyrone. Hey, Jesus. I understand how projects would be top of resume for quant dev research software engineers, but what about trading? Good question. Trading is also important to be frank. Now I'm going to give you guys a look at the world of where trading is heading. Trading is heading to the world of software engineering. I'm not saying you have to be, excuse me, a software engineer as a trader. What I am saying though, is if you don't know Python, R or MATLAB in 10 years, it'll be very hard for you to be a trader. If you go to a lot of these job descriptions online and you look at quant trader, quant trader, you'll see must haves, which is good under pressure, understands some option theory, etc., and you will see nice to haves. Nice to haves help you stand out. So if you know Python, if you know R, if you know MATLAB, that will really help you stand out because to be frank, 80% or more of traders do not know a single line of Python. All right, so if you're able to stand out as a trader, you're, you will be the type of trader that writes some code and you will be highlighting projects that you've written based off your knowledge of code on your pet projects uh, section. For example, a heat map. Let's just say you have a, in Python, you generate some sort of heat map on the Y axis is uh, strike prices on the right axis of a given call on the right axis is stock prices. And in the middle, you have a heat map that shows P and L across various stock prices and strike prices. Even something as simple as that will go a long way in terms of your pet project section on a quant trading, uh, quant trading resume. All right, guys, once again, I see a lot of questions here, but if there are no super chat questions, I'm going to go ahead and continue with my section here in terms of my actual content. All right, guys, where did we leave off? We left off it in terms of experience and how to construct a bullet point. Guys, this will either kill you or it will differentiate you. So make sure you're taking notes here. And guys, remember the likes, we need 50% likes for viewers. We have 100 viewers, we have 56 likes. If you don't get 50% likes in the next five minutes, if you don't pump up those likes, we're going to go to intermission. All right, how do we structure the actual resume section for each bullet point that you have there? A lot of people miss out on this, guys. It's very simple. I call it the 2W and 1R approach. I just coined that right here, but it was super smooth. 2W, 1R approach. What is a 2W, 1R approach? You need to structure your bullet points like this. What? Start with an action word. Developed, constructed, collaborated, um, applied, studied, an action word. What? Then you want to talk about the how, where, when, why. That's the second W. The second W is those three other how, when, where, whys, right? Not the what. The first is the what you did, how, where, when, why. The last thing, guys, and if you're going to take anything out of this session, remember this, the last thing is the result. You have no idea how many people send over resumes. They say what they did, how they did it, who they did it with, but they never actually say what the result of their efforts were. Guys, an employer is going to be hiring you because you can produce results for their business. Now, if you don't have a result in your result section of that one bullet point, that is a massive, massive downfall for you because you're not saying what the heck happened. You worked on X, Y, Z, you explained who you did it, how you did it, what languages you used, why you did it, the problem that you solved, but you never say what the result was. And guys, the result can be as simple as my boss gave me a pat on the back. Of course, that's just like a little joke, but it can be as simple as that. The way you want to structure your result is this, have a quantitative result, all right? A trading engine performance increased by 30% as measured by. That's a quantitative result. Now, if you don't have a quantitative result, because you might work at a grocery store, for example, what you'll want to have is a qualitative result. All right. I got employee of the month award. I don't know, something along those lines. But guys, it is so, so important to have a result. Now, I see somebody here in the chat mentioned STAR, Situation, Task, Action, Result. That is for interviewing in a behavioral interview session. And maybe I'll do another live stream about that. But guys, the result is different. The result on your resume is a two W's one R approach. 
It is the quantitative result. And if you don't have that for some reason, a qualitative result. All right, guys, that is how you structure your experience section. Now, how many experiences should you have? You have no idea how many resumes I've seen that are three pages long. People are talking about their experiences for the past 20 years. I don't care what you did 15 years ago. I don't care what you did in kindergarten. All right, people are literally telling me what they did in high school. That's not important. What is more important is recency what the most recent and relevant thing is. So if you don't have the most relevant, focus on recency, but order it in terms of recency and then relevancy. Okay, what you, most, what you did most recently and then what's the most relevant. If you're applying for a quant trading, a quant developer role and you have a previous experience in, in, in game dev, that's fine. If you have some sort of previous experience in some trading faculty or development faculty, that's probably more relevant, it should be up there. But maybe game dev is another piece of your experience that you go ahead and fill out that experience section with. What I'm getting at here, guys, is what's important is recency, relevancy, and don't go into a tirade of like 30 years worth of experience that you've done. No, what's important is what you've done more recently. If somebody asks you in the interview, what have you done 10 years ago? Yeah, go ahead and tell them but that's not important to get your foot in the door to get into the interview. All right, guys, at the same time, you wanna write the date. You know, like I said, consistent date formatting, but you wanna write from X date to X date and make sure that it's aligned, yada, yada, the design part, and make sure that when you're talking about your current experience, you do date to present. Okay, once again, guys, if you're new, welcome. If you want a question answered, put it in the super chat. Otherwise, I'm gonna continue with my content here. Now, I wanna take this time to go on a little tangent with regards to experience, okay? This tangent involves honesty. A lot of people in my private one-on-one -on -one sessions will ask me about honesty. Guys, this is a gray zone, and shout out here to uh, Josh Fluke. I think he was the first one to, to bring this up. Honesty is a gray zone. I do not endorse lying on resumes. I wholeheartedly do not endorse lying on resumes. But honesty is a gray zone because what a resume is, it is a marketing document. It needs to have its optics converted into a way that suits what the employer is looking for. So let me show you an example where we get into the gray zone of resume construction. And what some people would say is lying, some people would say is not lying at all, right? This is all dependent on your own ethical perceptions and don't tr violate your ethical perceptions if you don't need to, right? So this is one example. On people's resume, sometimes they might have junior trading, quant trading developer. A lot of people that come with my one-on-one -on -one sessions, they tell me, you know, should I write junior? Should I write intern quant developer? Okay. If you are an intern in the sense that you really, you're literally an intern, like you just finished your internships, I would say, yes, put intern quant developer. But some people out there would put quant developer. I'm perfectly fine with that. I think that's a gray zone in the sense of getting rid of the word intern. I think that's a gray zone. And I do understand that some people might think that's lying, but I see it as optics and marketing because your resume is a marketing document, right? Like I said, some people are fine with that. Some people are not. I think it's fine to get rid of that intern word there. If they ask you in the interview, were you an intern? Was this an internship? Yes, of course you say, yes, it was. You don't say no, but if they don't ask, you don't need to tell. All right, another example, a lot of people come to my one-on-one -on -one sessions that they pay for, they book my time and they say, Coding Jesus, we reviewed this resume, I have a question. My question is, I have junior software engineer here. Can I get rid of junior? My personal take is, if you've worked for two years in professional software engineering experience, but your title was still called junior, I, I think that's fine to get rid of that to get rid of the word junior. Now, let's, like, again, like I said again, some people think this is a gray zone. Shout out to Joshua Fluke. Some people think it's a gray zone, but I put it this way. When an employer tells you you have unlimited pay time off, is that them lying? No, it's not lying. It's a gray zone. It's marketing. It's the way that they pull in candidates by saying we have unlimited pay time off. In reality, your pay time off is not unlimited. You can't tell your manager I'm never coming to work, right? So was the employer lying by saying you have unlimited pay time off? Um, gray zone, gray zone, right? So. 
It all depends on your degree of comfort, but in your experience section, if you're struggling with the word junior and you have two years experience in the industry, I get rid of junior. You're not technically a junior anymore. And in a lot of these quant trading firms, they don't even have titles junior, senior. They have uh, systems engineer. There's no junior, senior engineer. There's experienced and there's internship. So if you're experienced, you have 30 years or 10 years or two years, you fall under experienced. All right. Um, once again, guys, super chats, um, questions, put them in super chat. All right. Hi, guys. Hey, hey, everybody. Nice to see you. All right. Now let's get into the additional information section. And this is one of the last sections before we actually take a look at a resume that I think was very poorly written. And then we're going to get into, and I'm going to show you guys why it was poorly written. And then we're going to actually get into your resumes live. And some people sent me their resumes live. So if you're still watching, hang tight. The additional information section. This part goes at the bottom of your resume, okay? So you have your projects, work experience, education, additional information, or if you're an experienced hire, you have your work experience, education, maybe you have some projects you wanna talk about and then additional information. All right, so what's in your additional information section, guys? It's anything you find relevant to employment, but this section can also really kill you. Let me give you an example. What you might want to have is something like skills, so for example, if you didn't talk about Git in your work experience, put it in your skill section, just write Git. If you didn't talk about Jira in your experience section, just put Jira. If you didn't talk about, you have a background in, in web development because that's not relevant in terms of experience, you might wanna put it there like Node.js or whatever. If you worked in teamwork or you worked with Cassandra or SQL or comfortable with Linux, and you never talked about Linux in your work experience section, you probably should, but if you didn't do that, put it down there in the skills section. Bullet point, bam, 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 okay? Another thing you want there, which I think is important, some people might disagree with me, it all depends on how much real estate you have left. Talk about languages, languages, right? So skills, put the word skills in bold, Jira, SQL, Cassandra, blah, 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 blah. Next section, languages. Obviously, if you're applying to an English speaking company, don't put English, right? That's a requirement. If you speak Mandarin Chinese, so if you can speak Mandarin, write Mandarin in there. If you can speak Korean, write Korean in there. And maybe in brackets, put your fluency. Now, why do I say this is important, church? Why do I say this is important, congregation? It's important because as human beings, we have a more primal connection with people that we speak the same language to. If I'm some brown dude and I'm speaking fluent Chinese and my interviewer is Chinese, he will have some sort of connection to me based off the fact that we're communicating in his mother tongue. That will show him or that will build that form of connection that you need in an interview. All right. Whether you agree with it or you don't agree with it, that's the way things work nowadays. So if you speak Mandarin, write Mandarin down there if you're applying for an English speaking company. All right. Another section, another part of the additional information section, and guys, this will either make or break you, is interest section, your interests. You like basketball, put basketball down there. You like men's fashion, put men's fashion down there. You like boxing, put boxing down there, all right? But why did I say this section will kill you? This part of the additional information section will kill you because I've seen people put League of Legends. I've seen people put Dota 2. I've seen people put wacky things. Don't put Dota 2. I love Dota. I love playing Dota. I think it's a great game. But guys, unfortunately, there's a stereotype out there that video gamers are lazy and they're degenerate. That's, it's unfortunate. And it might not even be a conscious bias, but it's out there. All right, so don't put... Dota, League of Legends, uh, Hearthstone, Diamond, Tier, it won't impress people. It might impress your friends. It's not going to impress a lot of recruiters out there. Okay. And guys, the last section, which you don't really need to talk about, it's a given, I discussed it at the beginning, is the title section, which comes at the top of your resume. Okay, guys. Okay. We just discussed a lot in terms of resume. Let's take a look at a poorly constructed resume resume diablo 3 no that won't go uh if the guy at the other end of the table in your interview says he plays diablo 3 then talk about diablo 3 i think this guy's joking don't put anime don't put that your favorite anime is elf and lead that's my favorite anime don't put that down there 
Poker might be okay. Poker might be okay, to be frank. But um, it's risky. It's a risk. And I wouldn't take that risk in the actual interview. Alrighty, guys. Let's take a look here. So I'm going to move to my screen. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? I moved to my screen. Alrighty, let's take a look at a really, really, really poorly constructed resume. Okay, this is where we apply what we've actually learned. This is where we apply what we've actually learned. Let's take a look at this resume. Alrighty, where do we start? See, that's an issue. Let me actually also make sure that you can see my face here. So give me a second, guys. We're building the plane as we fly it. Let's see here. So all righty, let's see here. I'm going to put myself down here. I don't know why there's this massive border. But I'm gonna put myself down here. You guys can see me, right? Alrighty, chat, let me know where you can see me. And guys, likes and donations go a long way. I'm giving you a lot of information for free here. And I will even go into a free for all session at the end because I'm really enjoying this. So guys, likes and donations. If you have questions, donate. This is all free knowledge for you guys. If you appreciate this sermon, make sure to tithe to the church. Okay. Let's get into this resume. So guys, look at this resume and start thinking of what actually went wrong here as you are looking at this resume. Based on what I've told you, what went wrong here? So remember, let's talk about purpose first. Purpose is a marketing document. And the first step is the design. This is extremely poorly designed. A marketing document needs to take advantage of all available real estate on that marketing document. And guys, this does not take advantage of any real estate at all. A bunch of white space, I don't even know where I'm, where do I look first? There's like columns, his name is at the top left and he has like, throws a bunch of links at the top and it looks like he's telling me a story in each. I don't even know where to start. And guys, are, uh, an employer won't even look at this. They'll just throw it out. This is not quant dev material at all. And, and this guy isn't even applying for a quant dev role to be fair, but don't do this, all right, don't do this. Okay, let's take a look. Let's just start at the top. Uh, making stories on shoestring budget since 2004. Okay, you're kind of bragging that you built you built low budget games, and if this is a low budget studio, maybe that's fine. But if you're applying for you know the super game studios out there, I don't know EA or whatever their game studios out there. I'm not a game designer. Bragging about building games with shoestring budgets, maybe that's impressive, maybe it's not, but it just seems a little risky to talk about to begin with. Okay, this is dusty and rusty. Yeah, so goal. Goal is to gain meaningful employment where I can fully fulfill my passion of game development and further the business opportunities. No shit. That's why you're applying for this role, okay? Another thing that I talked about, guys, is he says he's passionate. Fulfill my passion. Employers do not care about what you say. They care about what you do and what you've showed. So don't talk about passion. Show me you're passionate by your projects and by your work experience. Technical game dev skills. Uh, Unity, C Sharp, C, C++, SDL, Lua, game design, network programming, business marketing experience, extremely fast learner. React, Node, MySQL, NPM, Webpack, Babel, Karma, Jasmine, Semantic, Bootstrap, JSTS, HTML, CSS, Git, GitHub, GitLab, Docker. This stuff would go into an additional information section. You know what? Let's go ahead and Let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and juxtapose these two, okay? Let's go ahead and juxtapose these two because I want you to see a bad resume and then I want you to see my resume. And guys, everybody out there probably knows my name. I'm not shy. I don't care about people knowing my name. That's not an issue. I'm not hiding from anybody. I'm not trying to sell people any, uh, any products that I'd be afraid if I tried to scam that they'd come after me. I, I don't do any of that. So. I'm not afraid of sharing my name, Tomer Tzadok, that's my name. There we go, all right. Okay, so this information here 
with regards to technical game dev skills, technical web skills, this information should go at the bottom in an additional information section on the skills part, right? Skills, as you can see, that's what we talked about. And this was the actual resume that I used to apply to uh, positions as somebody that had no experience in software engineering. So I applied to various companies, got various offers with this resume. So I'm gonna use this as the gold standard for the purpose of this video. Maybe it's not as good as some people out there think. Regardless, it gave me results. It gave me a couple of offers, so I'm going to use this. Okay. Okay, no one can hear you? Somebody says no one can hear me. Uh, that's weird. Okay, I think people can hear me. Moderators, if people are just saying weird stuff over there, just take them out because it just uh, disrupts the stream. All right. Um, get rid of this goal section. I don't know why you have a goal. That's the whole point of why you're applying for this position. Okay, 2020 to current, that's fine. 2018 to when, right? So no attention to detail here. 2018 to when, I have no idea. I'm assuming to 2020. All right, he has the name of the game here, um, Persistent Browser-Based Game. You don't need to have this here. Um, you need to have here where you built this game. For example, in Hong Kong, if you were employed by a company, who employed you? Uh, if you're not employed by somebody, you should say self-employed, but you should say who employed you there. All right, what you'll notice too in terms of design guys is there's colors here like crazy. The guy didn't even take the time to hyperlink these GitHub links. Look what I did here. In terms of C++ portfolio, I didn't have a link. I just said my GitHub name. So in terms of GitHub, you can write say, say the name in the section title. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know why there's colors here. Uh, okay, now this is where the experience section gets really whack. He's giving me a story here. He's giving me a story, okay? Look at the difference between this story and these clear and concise bullet points, which we'll look at in a second. This is an as yet unreleased game began developed at the beginning of 2020 as my entry to Decade Jam. I've single-handedly developed a microservice-based game engine using Node.js and planned out the expected feature list. I also set up and built the pipeline using privately hosted Docker registry and private Gidea instance. It is currently open alpha and you can sign up for it anytime. Oh, Egg Trainer. Okay. I accidentally revealed the, the game name, but who cares? This guy posted his resume publicly anyway, so it doesn't matter. All right, guys. A lot of people will read this resume and read this experience section and think, hey, there's no problem. But the people that say, hey, there's no problem are probably the same people shooting their resume out to 200 companies and not receiving a single interview. Because this is not a good way to discuss your experience. There's no detail. There's no, I don't know what problem you worked on, what you did, how you solved it, what the result was. Now let's take a look at my resume. Now my resume is even more far detached from software engineering because this was me applying for a position without having any software engineering experience and I was able to spin it better than this person has right here. Okay, let's take a look at, can we zoom here? Yeah, all right. Let's take a look at how I structured my bullet points. Once again, guys, the two W's and the R. Okay, analyst, graduate rotational program, BitMEX Central Hong Kong. That's what he should have had here. His game name, who he worked for, where he worked for, and the date. He has a date, which is fine. On my research rotation, rotation, this is what I did. Tell me the degree of detail and clarity here is not mind-boggling in terms of the differences between these two resumes. Partnered with Jeremy Lucid, so I talked about what. What did I do? Now I get to the second W, who. Who, how, why, etc. Who? With Jeremy Lucid from KX Systems to improve on the initial white paper. So that's, you know, what's going on here. Of Q Explorer. Now I hyperlinked the white paper and I hyperlinked Q Explorer. So if an employer is interested in knowing what the project is, he can click on Q Explorer. Guys, I'm noticing my likes are a little down. There's a lot of new viewers. Make sure to like this, guys. That's all I ask from you guys. Just some likes. Uh, a Bitcoin blockchain explorer. So they already know what this is. What is the result? What is the result? Data from Q Explorer used in the publication of Where is the Justice? And that's hyperlinked as well. So the result wasn't quantitative in nature. It was a code contribution in Q or KDB. And that is a qualitative result. Let's take a look at another problem that I solved that I decided to discuss in terms of one of my bullet points here. Designed and built Q mempool. That's the first W in the 2W and the R approach. Designed and built Q mempool. They already know what I'm talking about. 
Now, how, why, uh, with who, that's the next W of the 2W approach. A stake-based database, which captures the change in the state of all broadcast Bitcoin transactions and accompanying memory pool metadata. What was the result? Deployed under BitMEX infrastructure, how did I do it? I used Docker and Kubernetes. That's where you put in the buzzwords in terms of what the employer is looking for. They're looking for somebody that has Docker experience. Well, hey, I deployed this infrastructure with Docker and Kubernetes. What, what was another result? You know, I deployed it, like what happened with it? So the result was it got deployed. What, was the, what, what happened with it? Well, I didn't have a quantitative result here, so I decided to include a qualitative result used by research and data analytics teams. I could have had a stronger result and said how exactly it was used. For example, used by research, uh, the, used by the research team in four published articles. That is, I, that's actually better than what I have here because that's more quantitative than what I have here, which is qualitative. Now, Church, I love that you're quiet. Everybody's very quiet here. Uh, everybody's very in tune with what I'm saying, but if you want to tie through the church, make sure to throw some donations in there. If you have questions, throw donations. We're gonna open up the floor later on to a free for all in terms of questions here. So if you wanna ask a question, make sure to put it in the super chat. All righty. We already know the experience section here is very poor on this guy's resume. So we don't need to go into his next section here. What I really want to highlight here, guys, is he's missing his education section. He's missing his additional information section. He's missing incredible amounts of detail. And he's being lazy by simply putting links here. Okay, if you're going to have a Nintendo link, in this Nintendo Switch part, hyperlink it. In the Linux part, hyperlink it. In the Windows part, hyperlink trail.gg. Very simple things. This guy's been complaining that he's not been getting a lot of reception from game development companies. I can tell why, and he actually hasn't been listening to anybody's advice that has been trying to give him advice, and he's gonna stay stuck for a very long time if he does indeed choose to not provide, uh, not listen to people's advice. Alrighty, guys. Now, I did a previous video showing my resume, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. We're almost an hour into this, guys, or we're exactly an hour into this, so I wanna open up the floor to other people's resumes. All right. Now, who do I wanna open it up to? Well. I want to open it up to anybody that's previously sent me their resume. All right, guys, this is the link. This is the link. If you want to join, I'm going to pin it to this, pin it to, uh, I'm going to pin it to the super, to the live stream. So if you sent me your resume, if you sent me your resume and would like to join, I'd like to speak to you. I'd like to speak to you if your initials are A, A, G, C, J, sorry, J, C, J, L, S, B, and M, S. If you're out there, I want to speak to you. Aniket Ray, let's see here. I want to speak to you if you've submitted your resume to me. Hello, can you hear me? Well, you can hear me. You can hear me through YouTube. Can you hear me? Have you submitted your resume to me? I can't hear a single thing that you are saying. Mohammed Said, give me a sec. All right, let's go in here. All righty, Mohammed, give me a sec. Uh, a lot of people. Hello? Hey, hey, one Hello? sec. Can you hear me? Uh, one sec, one sec. How do I? Hello? Well, you can hear me. You can hear me. YouTube. Uh, mute, me. mute, YouTube 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 mute YouTube in the background, guys. I can't hear a single thing. Guys, mute YouTube from the background. Yeah. I... Mohammed Say, give me a sec. Guys, you, if you have YouTube in the background, please mute it. All right, let's go. Mohammed, is your uh, YouTube right, muted? Mohammed, give me a sec. Uh, a lot of people. Hello? Hey, hey, one Hello? sec. Can you hear me? Mohammed, can you mute your YouTube? Hello? Well, we can't hear you. Uh, mute, mute, mute YouTube in the background, guys. Guys, mute YouTube from the background. Uh, yeah. Mohammed, uh, have you muted YouTube in the background? Mohammed said. Uh, I don't think you can hear me. Mohammed, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? All right, I can't hear you. Guys, we're building the ship as we're flying it. 
Can you hear me, Muhammad? We have two Jesus. Yeah, we're competing here. <laughs> Muhammad, I, I can't hear you. Can you talk? I can't hear you for some reason. Guys, can you hear Muhammad? I can't hear him. Let's see. All right, Muhammad, I'm going to... Uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, Muhammad left. So let's get other people in here. If you're, if you send me your resume, if you send me your resume, make sure to join. Oh, he's back. Can you hear me? All right. I can't, I can't hear you. So I'm going to go to somebody else. Muhammad, give me a sec. That's okay. You're, you're a patron. So we'll, we'll discuss in our private session. If that's cool with you, man. Cool. All righty here. Can you hear me, Sahil? Oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. Guys, chat, can you hear Sahil? So just, just talk talk a bit, Sahil? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, just testing, testing. You guys can hear me? Chat, can you hear him? Can you hear Sahil? Awesome, they can hear you. Awesome, Sahil. So we're going to take a look at your resume. Um... I'm going to put it up here. Uh, tch, tch, tch. Okay, this is, and you have YouTube muted in the background, right? Yeah, so I'm just using okay. like headphones. Awesome, awesome. So this is the uh, the resume that you sent me, is that correct? Uh, it's just taking a little while to load, like I can't no see the problem. screen on there. So I'm just watching the stream, so it's taking a little while to load on there. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the one. Okay. Okay, yeah, awesome. It. So can, can you, before we actually get into the resume, can you tell our viewers, tell me, tell me what you're applying for, your background, just like a one to two minute thing so the viewers can understand um, what you're trying to apply for and your previous experience before you get into this. Yeah, sure. I think I described a little bit on the email, but uh, basically uh, previous to this, I went to college for finance. And so all my like experiences are in finance, like internships. And then, um, and then I had to leave college early. Like I had to withdraw from college due to a medical emergency. And then I spent the last three years uh, running an automated marketing systems company um, in Las Vegas. And uh, this past year, so 2020, I went back to school, but this time in computer science. And um, I'm currently looking for a position in that, like an internship right now in that field. Okay, so you're a computer science. What year are you in computer science? So uh, with all my credits transferred and everything, right now I'm a um, sophomore. Okay. I, I'm not too familiar with the uh, nomenclature in the U.S., to be frank. So is sophomore oh. second year, third year? Second, second year, yeah. Second year, okay. And what, what, what's your goal? Are you, what are you looking to get into? Yeah, so I was looking, um, to be honest, like I, I was really early. This is my first year, so kind of in general. So I was interested in like quantum development, but obviously I feel like my... Um, uh, my resume is really not geared towards any software development role. So I guess just overall software development. Okay. Yeah, like internships, yeah. Okay, cool. Let me just see. Am I able to just block people from <laughs> trying to spam getting into this? Uh, let me just see here. Okay. Okay, it's fine. Uh, I'll, we'll figure that out a little later. Okay, so you're trying to get into quant development, quant trading, but the real problem here is that you see that you don't have much previous experience in the space. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. So I'd love some feedback on either like what projects to start doing so I can put them on there or like how to reformat my resume as it is to okay. um, better see that. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So let's first talk about purpose, design, and then content. So purpose is you want to get into quantitative development and you want to highlight your strengths to the employer to show them you're a qualified fit for the position. Now, have you done in uh, research about the industry, what you would need? Um, to become a quantitative developer and kind of the, have you looked at the job descriptions to become a quantitative developer? So yeah, just to be clear, uh, right now I'd be applying for like internships, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, so a lot of those, like they're asking very, very like low bar stuff. So they just ask you like, oh, do you, have you ever had exposure to certain languages or have you had, all right, like, so that's kind of what I included where like I have exposure to like Python, C++. Right. Um, yeah. Right, so what, what I was pretty much just wanted to make sure is that you, I did some industry research so you understand kind of the rules and requirements so that, that's the first step let's look at design first before we look at content in terms of design i like what you did here it seems like you 
uh, took inspiration from maybe a video that I previously made or about resume creation, or, or maybe you just did this yourself, but I think it looks good in terms of a design perspective. We'll get into the nitty gritty, but in terms of design, you're clearly utilizing all the white space on your resume. It is one page. It has bold sections. Um, it seems like the dates are for consistently formatted. You have your locations consistently formatted. You have horizontal sections. You don't have the cartoonish pictures and graphics, etc. Now, I just want to bring this up here, guys. Sometimes people will put their picture on their resume. Don't do that. It's a route to discrimination. Um, it's a, just a route to prejudice. Again, maybe some people are prejudiced. Who knows? But there's no upside in it. So if you have a picture on your resume, make sure not to put it there. Um, some countries require it, like countries like China requires you to have a picture. But let's not do that. Okay. Let's start looking at the actual content here. In terms of content, you need to understand which sections will work best for you. As somebody that has no previous experience and somebody that's transitioned into software engineering and is, and is studying it in school, which is great, you need to have a pet project section. And I don't see that here. You need to have a pet project section. That should be the first section of your resume. Now, if you looked at my resume, I had my pet project section and I had my GitHub link at the top there. You really need to spend time on you. You do have time as a second year student to start building pet projects. Now you want to go into quant development and you probably have an understanding that C++ and C sharp or Python is going to be important. So you want to build projects that are oriented around C++ or C sharp development. As I mentioned before, how do you know which projects to build? We'll start thinking about very small financial concepts. For example, Black Shoals. Black Shoals is a model used to price options. So in Black Shoals, what, or what you'd rather want to do rather in the project section is build a Black Shoals option pricer. It can be very, very simple. Prompt the user to input five different variables, strike price, interest rates, time to expiry, et cetera, et cetera, and then spit out an option price. It doesn't need to be too in-depth. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, totally. I'm just writing down notes with like my free hand. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Um, that would be the first section you need. And that's really what's going to help you stand out in terms of um, uh, being uh, working against uh, your competition, which is other university students and people that didn't go to university for this field. Now, what I also think um, is worth noting here, and I think it's important because you also mentioned medical withdrawal. Now, I'm not going to get into that. That's your own private life. That's not important. But a lot of people out there have gaps on their resume. And many people, because of medical withdrawal, may have a gap on their resume. It might be medical withdrawal. It might be a family crisis, etc. How do those people stand out in terms of their performance against the crowd? Like I said, guys, your pet project section. It's possible that you had some sort of medical withdrawal or you needed to leave for some reason, um, but maybe on the side you worked on some pet projects. And even if you didn't on the side, it took all your time of all the day to, to work on you know, your medical withdrawal or whatever. You can still post medical withdrawal, display your skill set by building out some projects that you can show an employer. So when an employer says, can you explain me your gap on your resume? You can say X, Y, Z happened to me. I, you know, it was unfortunate and unexpected, but I wanted to highlight my strengths and my experience, not based off things that I did before my withdrawal, but rather things that I've learned either during the withdrawal or after the withdrawal. And I've taken that knowledge and converted it into projects that I want to highlight to you. If that's a bond pricer in the interview, if you get the interview, you can walk them through your bond pricer. I mean, I've done that in an interview. I have built a little video game and in the interview, at the end of the interview, I've walked them through my video game. So that's a, a nice way to, to kind of fill in the gaps for a lot of people that are coming from pl places that they might have taken a uh, long time off or they just decided to join the industry and they wanted to transition, etc. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, actually, actually uh, uh, I, I saw your your like the video game and everything, and um, yeah, one, one of the pet projects I have is a like uh, a video game that I made in like Python. So okay. I was gonna port it onto Swift and get it onto iOS before adding it to my resume. But hopefully, okay, it should be awesome. done like in the next month or so. Awesome, that's an that sounds like a great project. Python is definitely something that a lot of quantitative trading firms uh, work with, so that is great. Let's get into your education section here. Um, in terms of education, um. Let's see here, education, New Jersey Institute of Technology, uh, Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science. Okay, so right off the bat here, chat, do you know what I'm already thinking of here? Maybe chat knows, maybe they don't know. I'm gonna give them a little time to think about it, but like I said before, a resume is a marketing document and real estate is extremely valuable. What you could have done here, instead of saying to having two lines for your school and then your uh, degree, make this one line, say your degree, and then do comma, and then have the school that you've gone to. There's no need to have a, a separate line for each one of these things. So 
bachelor's of computer science, bachelor's of science in computer science. I would just say bachelor's in computer science. No need to, you know, that's just the standard bachelor's in computer science. Once again, people will say, are you lying on your resume by not saying bachelor's of science in computer science? I don't think it is. Bachelor's of computer science. I mean, you're computer science students for, for, you know, all intents and purposes, bachelor's of computer science. That's fine. Then your school there. Um, also, Newmark, New Jersey, that should just be a, on the same line that you have the Institute of Technology, comma, Newmark, New Jersey, and then expected, 20, uh, expected graduation 2020, that's fine. In terms of GPA, GPA shouldn't be bolded, it should simply be a bullet point. A bullet point, achieve the GPA of 4.0 out of 4.0. That's great, um, but it's missing some detail in terms of, is this your cumulative GPA? Is this your GPA in your second year? Is this your GPA in your first year? So you can say, uh, currently uh, or achieved or currently possessing a cumulative GPA of 4.0 out of 4.0. I like how you did 4.0 out of something because a lot of people just have 4.0 and in Canada, it's 4.0 out of 4.3. So that might be a little deceiving. Uh, Rutgers University, Bachelor's in Arts, once again, same, same thing here. I like how you have your awards. That's one of the three things that I talked about. Awards, uh, GPA, and competitions that you've won. So, sorry, scholarships, awards, and competitions that you've won. Academic excellence, great, graduated sophomore, great, what award you've had here, great dean's list, great honor society, great, great, great. All right, let's take a look at the next section here. Uh, work experience, I like the section, how it's structured. Sky Blue Marketing, once again, I would have the actual title before you write Sky Blue Marketing, so you can save real estate space. You'll have Sky Blue, Mar you'll have owner and CEO, Sky Blue Marketing, uh, the location, and then the date, all in one line. The date, of course, will be right where it's indented, just like your education. All right, here. I already noticed that you have indented bullet points. I never do that. What I do is I have semicolons if I want to separate distinct ideas. Um, let's see here. So, no, okay. Um, I have semicolons if I want to split distinct ideas there. Okay. Um, Utilize social media, advertising platforms, primarily Facebook ads to drive direct consumer sales. And notable product launches include um, uh, product sales of 43,000 in 10 days, uh, 78,000 in 21 days, 51,000 in nine days, and 133,000 six days. Total Facebook advertising spent of over 100,000 in multiple Facebook advertising accounts. Okay. You're describing what you, so this isn't very relevant to quant development. I'm still gonna entertain it. Um, utilize social media and advertising platforms, primarily Facebook to direct uh, customer sales. That's great, that's what you did. Um, I'm not sure what you did it for. So did you do it for a set of consulting clients? Who'd you do it for? It seems like you've done it for yourself, but it's unclear. Um, I like how you said how you did it. So notable product launches, product sales, blah, blah, blah. You detailed that. No need to go into like in 10 days and 21 days and whatever, six days. Just talk about maybe in the six day one or pick the most impressive one. Now you have another bullet point, but nowhere here do I see the result of what you've done. What was the result? Have you driven um, sales by 20% for whatever? Have you done X, Y, Z? W what have you done? Um, and that isn't very clear here in terms of what you've actually done. Um, so that's something that you'd want to discuss in terms of what the result was. I've driven this company as a client's performance by 20% in this field, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna go into one more of your experience here. And, and to be frank, there's a lot of experience here. What I would suggest is pick the most relevant thing. Like I said, ordering in terms of relevancy and in terms of recency. So recency, then relevancy. The reason I'm not gonna entertain reading a lot of these is because when you have a pet project section, you're not going to have space for all of these. You're going to be getting rid of the things that are least important to you, the things that are lower on in the scale here. I think Goldman Analyst is actually uh, quite an important and pretty impressive work experience, and it's especially relevant because it's still in the finance space. So, for example, um, let's just take a look here. Summer Analyst, Fick Trading Desk, Fixed Income, Trading Desk, Mortgage Backed Securities Team, Goldman Sachs, New York. That's very nice. Um, offered full-time financial analyst position on completing a summer internship, worked in the MBS product team for specific products within the clearing business of Goldman Sachs, performed daily profit and loss and balance sheet analysis for mortgage business. This is very general and it doesn't follow my 2W approach. You said what? So I worked in the MBS team for specific products. So you have to, I would detail what products. So that's the second W, you know, uh, with who, right? So, you know, the MBS team, but who, which product? Um, what was the problem you were solving? I don't know what that is. Um, how you did it, I don't know how you did it. 
Um, there's a lot of questions here that I still have that are unanswered. And if you look at my resume in the middle of this video, you will see the degree of detail I go in in terms of the second W and the two WR approach. And that will really help guide you in terms of what you need to write. There's also no result here. So you did things. You performed daily profit and losses and a balance sheet analysis. But what was the result? It can be quantitative. It can be qualitative. It can be qualitative enough to be my, I got the, I got, oh, uh, performance was, uh, performance exceeded expectations uh, landing me or resulting in a full-time financial analyst offer, right? That would be a great way to highlight full-time financial analyst offer. Um, and that's a great qualitative result, actually much stronger than I got employee of the month or whatever. Okay, let's continue here. Uh, da -da -da, professional leadership. Uh, see, this section you don't need. I think it might be worth talking about in an interview. If they ask you, tell me a time where you display leadership, but it's not going to be relevant for your section of your resume. And I think your pet project section should be the main part of your resume, given your medical leave. And that should take up a very large part of your resume. So this, this part you can delete. Um, alrighty here, skills, activities, and interests. Uh, this section is very important. Python, Java, C++, Pascal, and intermediate in Microsoft Excel. I wouldn't say intermediate in Excel, just say Microsoft Excel. I would also highlight, I would remove technical and I just write skills. What I would also highlight is non-coding non based skills or non-coding based um, uh, programs you've worked with. Git, uh, GitLab, GitHub, Jira, Teamwork. All these things will be relevant. SQL, well SQL is programming. It's not a programming language, it's a database uh, query language, but it's still important. SQL, Cassandra, all these things are very important to include there. Volunteering and activities, week one, hidden gems, special Olympics, competitive programming and weightlifting. That's all great. Those are great volunteering activities. I would include that there. If you have space, I would include languages if you speak another language. Does all this make sense? Is all this connecting? This is really helpful, especially like, um, I don't know if you mentioned it before, like the, the two W's are like that's I didn't format mine like that at all. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I guess like the only question I would have kind of, I really appreciate your feedback and everything is um, in terms of specific projects, I think you mentioned like the bond prizer, but you, do you have any others that would be like, um, like you'd, you'd recommend me like to add to the resume? Sure. So I would have a bond, like I did a bond price or what, but, but the, the idea isn't that everybody should have a bond price. So the idea is pick a simple financial concept and build on top of it. So for example, uh, a black Scholes option pricer is something that shows you're interested in the space and that you've programmed something relevant towards the position. Now, another thing is a lot of these firms have a lot of server client, a lot of server client infrastructure. They have servers that crunch numbers. They might send it to other servers, which might then do something else with it, have risk limits generated, and then send that to clients to display on the front end. So if you build like a front end visual tool for risk display, that might be cool. It can be as something as simple as a heat map, like I said, of strike prices and option for, and, and stock prices, and then display P&L based off some initial P&L number of $10,000 in this option or something. Um, that will be very relevant. Um, so those are a couple of things that, that I would keep in mind, you know, Server something to display risk might be something, some server client application where somebody, um, in, like an order management, a simple order management system where somebody inputs an, a new order for security, it sends it to a server, the server might do something with it, but let's say it, say it saves it to a database. So it saves it to a table in a database. You have a securities table and you have a new order table that has a foreign key that's the securities table, for example. All those things are relevant uh, projects there. But thanks for getting on here, Sahil. I'm going to open up the uh, meeting to more people that want to join that have sent me their resume. So guys, if you haven't already sent me your resume and I've given people weeks to send me in their resume, then do not, uh, do not try to jump in here. Yeah, yeah, but thanks again for, for your feedback. I'll jump off the call now, but um, I'd love to get your like more formal feedback on a one-on-one -on -one session later, sure. like close to recruitment. So I'll sure, definitely so yeah, uh, email you about that. Cool, yeah, book a session okay. and uh, we'll talk. Sounds good. You're on the right track. All righty, guys. All righty. Let's do, let's do one or two more here. Let's do one or two more, so... One or two more, then we're gonna open it for free questions. Guys, a lot of people are tagging me. As I said, if you want to ask me a question, put it in the super chat. All right, let's see. Jordan, okay, I think Jordan. Hey, Jordan. Hey, hey yeah, how, you doing? how you doing? Yeah, I'm okay, better. Awesome, you sent me a resume, right? That's right, yeah. Okay. So, um, I guess my name is Bill. So. 
Okay, I'll just, I'll just call you Jordan, if that's cool. Cool. Awesome. Gorgeous. Awesome. So uh, welcome. Thanks for being uh, willing to jump on the live stream here. I appreciate it. Um, can you give us a little background like the previous caller in did in terms of your experience or, uh, you know, your background, your, maybe you're in school and, and what you're really aiming for? What's the goal here? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm currently studying my master's in computer science. Um, awesome. I have an undergrad in electrical and electronic engineering. And while I've been at school, I've had some internship experience. So um, I've interned at two investment banks. Um, one of them was a spring internship, so more so just getting an insight into the industry, um, the financial services industry as a whole, and uh, just working on a small group project, uh, presenting that. And then in my main summer internship, which was about 10 weeks, um, I was working in the algorithmic trading services team of the okay. investment bank. And um, there I was working with their um, trading engine, um, where I had to essentially, it was in C++ and I was making like essentially little tweaks. They, they didn't really um, give me such like large, such a large project as an intern, but also gave me introduced into the industry, right? Um, so I was more or less just um, learning how to adapt into the industry. Um, I wasn't as, um, I didn't do perform as well as I had hoped, and so I didn't get a return offer. So through that, um, I've now been trying to understand like from the ground up how to really succeed in this industry. So I've managed to get um, a internship um, starting in July at an investment management firm. Um, so with all the research I've been doing, uh, I came across a channel which has been absolutely helpful. Um, I intend to convert this um, internship into a full-time offer and I'm also applying for more roles in the quant developer space. Okay. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to put up your resume here as well, so we can take a look at it together here with uh, the rest of the viewers. Alrighty, and guys, if you're new to the uh, stream, make sure to give me a like here so we can, uh, you know, boost boost this in the algorithm. This is all free knowledge we're we're given here, so make sure to to give us a thumbs up. All right, so I'm looking at your resume here. Um, in terms of design, which is always where I like to start off with, this is a little messy to be frank. And why is it messy? Well, like I said, a resume is a marketing document and it's a piece of real estate and you want to be able to maximize the real estate here. The first thing that I talked about was uh, white space. And as you can see here, there's a lot of white space, meaning there's a lot of real estate that is simply not being utilized correctly, right? So you have a bunch of col you have a big column where there is a bunch of information that could be there that isn't. Um, education and qualifications, work experience, projects, etc. Now, because you are having a master's in computer science and you previously interned in the space, a project pet project section is not as important for you as it would be for somebody else. So I'm not going to go into the actual pet project section here uh, currently. Uh, we're not going to be speaking about it rather. Um, what I want to look at is just generally fixing this up and then highlighting your already current skill set because your current skill set seems extremely relevant for the position that you're applying for. Just got a super chat here. Really appreciate that session. Thanks for it. was really helpful. Awesome. Thank you for the super chat there, Sahil. Okay. What I think you should start off with and what I think you should lead with is your work experience section because you already have relevant experience in an industry that a lot of people are trying to break into. So I will start with work experience at the top. Now, before we even get there, you have a title, which is your name, telephone number, email, etc. It's split on two lines. You don't need two lines. You can have it as one line. One line where you have email and telephone number on the left-hand side, GitHub and LinkedIn on the right-hand side. There's a logical, uh, there's a logical break between the two. The left-hand side is how to contact you. The right-hand side is your work and some other links. Now, what I would do is instead of putting the actual link for your 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 uh, LinkedIn and the link for your GitHub, hyperlink it in the word GitHub and LinkedIn and find a separator to separate those two. In terms of your name, your name goes right in the middle. The font size is perfect. It doesn't have to be too big or too small. I like how your, your design is horizontal. So from the top to the bottom, somebody can easily scan through and understand what you're, what you're up about and what the different sections of your resume is. So you're gonna start off with your work experience. Now, this column here, in terms of uh, having a lot of space here, don't do that. Take your the place you worked and the position and move it to the right hand side. Work experience and right below it should be immediately your position, comma, the place you worked at, comma, the location and right indented should be the date. Just like I have it on my resume that I previously uh, brought up here. Let's see, am I able to bring it up? Uh, no, but you saw, you previously saw the, the resume that yeah. uh, I had there. So you understand what I'm getting at here. Okay, yeah. now, um, 
intern, incoming intern with the a, with the team developing their Python based uh, quantitative investment management suite. All right, so because this is incoming, this doesn't need to be on your resume. You're already joining this internship. Once you're done this internship, then you can flesh out this section. But I get what you were doing here. Um, awesome. The next thing is, uh, so I'm just going to ignore that that work experience. I'm going to look at the next one because it seems most relevant for now. So uh, summer technology analyst, I would call it trading technology. I will call it trading technology software engineer. All right. Get rid of summer. If you feel comfortable with it, like I said, it's a gray zone. Trading technology summer engineer. Technology analyst sounds like you are a, an investment banker working on the tech team or working on like the TMT team. So I wouldn't have that there. Algorithmic trading service is perfect. That's initially going to catch the recruiter's eye. It's the most relevant first piece of experience. Enhance the firm's C++ liquidity seeking engine by refining order attribution checks in preparation for whatever. I like how you started out with the what you did. Enhance. That's the first W. Then you need the where, when, why, how, okay? Mm-hmm. So you talk about what you did, enhanced whatever. You don't talk about how you did it. Um, for example, who you worked with. Uh, working with uh, the XYZ team uh, by doing XYZ, we were able to, uh, I, and the thing is with the word refine, I don't know what refine means, right? What does refine mean? Um, Upgrade, improve, I don't really know what refine means. Did you, refine can mean you rewrote it, right? So that the wording here isn't very detailed. So when you're looking at wording it, really tell them what you did. Tell them what problem you needed to solve. What, why did you need to refine it to begin with? What was the problem and how do you go about solving it? Then you wanna talk about the result. So what ended up happening, right? You refined it, but w- how did you measure the refinement? Was the speed of the matching engine or the liquidity seeking engine increased? Was you know, the throughput increased somehow. What was the actual uh, refinery here? What happened? That's going to be key here. So that that isn't there, and, and that will really, really uh, harm you in terms of applying for roles because you don't have the result. Um, improve testing coverage and relevancy by writing uh, unit tests in Python. Okay, it's nice that you know Python. I like how you have, but here you really only have the, the first W and the two WR approach. You have the what you did. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so... You know, you don't write for which, did you write it for a library? Did you write it for a module? Like, was it an integration test? Oh, you wrote unit tests, that's fine. Um, but a lot of details here is missing. Um, maybe you wanna quantify how much tests you actually wrote. You might wanna write, you did, you wrote 10 tests or you wrote a thousand lines worth of unit tests in Python, right? So there's a need to quantify this because you know, I can write five lines to unit test something in Python and that's theoretically I'm writing tests in Python. It doesn't tell me the impact and the reason for this, these, this test writing. And also right. in terms of result, um, did you improve? So you, you improve test coverage, but how is that measured? Was the code coverage previously 80% and now it's 90%, right? So I don't know what the, you know, was it a B and now it's an A? I don't know what the actual improvement here was um, in terms of code coverage here. Scope the design requirements for the implementation of an order book feed publisher for a new trading engine. So I don't know a lot here. I mean, this is very general. Scope design requirements. Does this mean you just wrote the requirements or did you actually design the trading engine? It's a little ambiguous for me. Um, Implement an order book feed publisher for a new trading strategy, trading engine. Uh, Was it a trading engine you wrote? Were you responsible for writing it? Once again, ambiguity and there's a lot of detail here missing. If you want to book a one-on-one session, we can go into exactly how this should be written. But I think you should really, you know, take in the advice currently that I'm giving you. Look at the resume that I previously written and displayed here, and really try to map the level of detail that an employer would require from the resume that I've written to your resume. Because I don't doubt that you have very relevant experience and very detailed experience that you can write in your resume. It's just that it wasn't really. It's not being communicated here currently. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, good. Thank you. Awesome. Developed an understanding for smart order routing, fixed protocol, and an appreciation for low latency order execution by navigating the code base. That's really nice. And I like how you have the buzzwords of low latency, fixed protocol, on smart order routing. But just saying that you read the code base, it isn't substantive enough to have it on this section of, of your work experience. If you do get it, gain an understanding for smart order routing, fixed, and low latency, I might have that in the additional information section of my resume. I might have additional information. Um, uh, sk- uh, uh, tangential skills or uh, related skills that have fixed SBE, you know, those, those relevant protocols 
um, uh, you know, smart order routing. You'd have that there. But if you can't really discuss an experience where you worked on smart order routing code, I wouldn't have it here as a bullet point. Awesome. Okay. Uh, projects, AI bias and facial recognition. Oh, didn't master's dissertation ongoing. That's really nice. I would remove the word ongoing here. If they ask you about it, say that it's ongoing. I wouldn't have ongoing there. Um, sure. Coded an assortment of Python scripts of silted ongoing technical investigation to race and gender biases in facial recognition technology. That sounds really cool, interfacial recognition technology. I want to know what the result is. I want to know, like, um, was was the assortment of these scripts able to, to, to detect some sort of some sort of bias in terms of racial bias or gender bias in AI. I know this is ongoing, but maybe you have some sort of initial hypothesis that you'd like to describe or that you'd like to talk about in terms of a result of what you've got came up to so far. Uh, wrote a data set filtering and labeling tools that which manipulates image metadata stored in JSON form. So a lot of questions here. There's not enough detail. I like how you said what you did. You wrote a data set filtering and labeling tool. What you write it in? In Python and C sharp, I have no idea. When you say yeah. you, you manipulated image meta metadata, which metadata did you manipulate and why? And you say stored in JSON form, how is it stored? Is it stored in a database? Is it stored in MySQL and MongoDB in Cassandra? I don't know how it's stored. So these are equally important things that you should be thinking about in terms of you know the level of detail that you would like to discuss. And then the result. Uh, you, and you know because you're not done, you might say uh, something, a qualitative or quantitative result like, Data set currently stands at 200 terabytes. I don't know, I'm just throwing that number out there. But you know, some sort of result as to, you know, you're saving and filtering, how far are you into this? Um, I'm gonna skip through a lot of these because I think it's uh, some repetitive uh, advice that I'm giving here. Programming, for, I just say, you don't say proficient in Python, just Python, C, C++, JavaScript, Git, GitLab, Jira, throw everything that you've known or touched on there. Fix, SBE, um, I don't know, like a Cassandra, MySQL, everything, everything that you can think of on there. doesn't have to be a paragraph, but just comma, bullet points separated there. Interests, running, reading, volunteering, awesome. These are all awesome things. I'd split it up. Instead of saying running, I'd say, uh, okay, you, yeah, say running. In brackets, say maybe a 5K marathon runner, something like that. Um, reading, um, that's fine. World history and, and, and psychology, that's great. Um, volunteering, all this is fine. Uh, all this is fine. All this is great. Um, maybe you want to break up some of these things so that you can flush them out a little more. Like uh, world history might be one one interest. Psychology might be another interest. Instead of putting reading and then in brackets, world history and psychology. And then if somebody talks to you about world history, say, yeah, I've read this book and that book and that book. Um, awesome. Achievements. Scholars, program recipient, levels in math. Awesome. This is great. Personally, I wouldn't include... Uh, your A levels, unless you just don't have, you just have a lot of space and you want to include them. Uh, I would include your scholars program recipient, but I wouldn't include in the additional information section. I'd include it in your education section. Now I'm not going to repeat um, feedback for the education section because it seems quite similar to the previous uh, person that called in Sahil. So I'm not going to repeat the exact same uh, advice that I gave Sahil, um, but the same advice would apply here. Uh, dates right centered or right aligned rather. The university, the degree, and the location should all be on one line. Uh, the university should be bolded. The degree might be italicized if you'd like it to. And one bullet point should be your awards. Another bullet point should be your GPA if you'd like to talk about your GPA. Does all that make sense? Yeah, good. Thank you so much. You are really awesome. awesome, awesome. Thank. I hope you know. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope you gained something from this live stream. I hope the viewers have as well. And um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at this. Thank you for joining. Awesome. See you. See ya. Bye bye. Yeah. Awesome guys, that was the rev the resume review live stream. Now I know a lot of other people have sent me resumes, but I've been talking for an hour and a half. My throat's really dry. I have some water here. I'm not done the live stream though, so don't leave, don't jump. Now I'm going to open the last half hour to comments or questions. So if you have any comments or questions, now is your chance. Comments or questions, whether it's in a super chat or not, I'm going to be giving more priority to the super chatters. But if this is not a, but if you do not want to super chat, I will now be looking at questions as well. Am I frozen? Can you see me? I'm frozen.
I am frozen. Guys, any questions you have? Anything about quant trading, about where I buy my shirts, about anything that doesn't involve me taking off my clothes, we're going to do that now. Yes, I, I'm frozen. I'm frozen. Give me a sec. Am I back? I'm back. Okay, I'm not frozen anymore. What hair care products do I use? I don't use as many hair care products as I'd like to. I don't. I just simply have shampoo and conditioner. And I have face... I use skincare products. Uh, skincare products for... To make sure that I don't have... Um, like eye... Black eye... Like... I forgot what it's called. Like deep eyes. Setting eyes. Uh, God bless you. God bless you too. Make sure that my skin looks good. Um, yeah, I just use skincare products. Yeah, I had a seg fault. <laughs> um, I've seen some YouTubers that like are super popular and like this guy has like his like this like it's nuts and he's always like this close to the camera I forget his name he's really funny though is it good to have a blog or website that shows your work uh, I don't know maybe if you're a senior yeah probably shows you're committed you're passionate and you know what you're talking about a junior maybe not so much um, yeah, eye bags, eye bags, what I was looking for. My skincare routine. Wake up in the morning, shower, I have a moist face. I take my uh, primary skincare for like just cleaning up, put it around my face, and then the skincare to prevent like eye bags, they put that there. Then I also take shea butter and I put it on the tip of my fingers because a lot of people have like cracked skin around their fingers because that's the most sensitive skin. I just put shea butter there. Is it a good idea to add courses that I've audited on Coursera to my resume? I don't know. I don't know if it's good to have that. I mean, if you don't have anything else, I'd put that there. But it seems a little... I don't know what auditing means. I would put that there. I'm up over 100k USD playing poker and can prove it as well. Should I include this in my resume? I intend to apply for quant trading inter interns. No, don't do that. Just say you like poker. If they talk about poker, they want to talk to you about poker, say that. But nobody, nobody's, nobody, don't brag about gambling. Say that you gamble, don't brag about it. Because they might think that you're a hereditary gambler and they might not want you to gamble with their own funds. Do I have any experience using AI in options risk management models? And if so, what architecture is related reading would you recommend to pursue? I don't. I don't have any AI experience. Guys, you can make a lot of money in traditional trading without the need for AI. AI isn't the be-all, end-all. It isn't the buzzword. And guys, if you're just joining, remember to hit the like button. Uh, yeah. What do you think about Coursera or edX programs? So I am a big fan of individual learning and teaching yourself. If you are disciplined enough to teach yourself, then do it. Go for it. I like Pluralsight. I think Pluralsight's way better than Udemy, way better than Coursera. They have their own learning paths that you can go down, and it's actually very, very useful. Their videos are amazing, top quality. I have learned how to code from Pluralsight. I have no problem saying that. I spent $30 a month, and I was able to get a job by simply grinding out Pluralsight, reading books, and making my own pet projects. Are you really in Mount Sinai? No, I'm not in Mount Sinai. Let's see here, more questions. Any comments of those who want to become an algorithmic commodity trading advisor? I don't know what you mean by trading advisor. Become an algorithmic commodity trading advisor? I don't know what that means. Yeah, I can talk about my prior experience before my quant experience. That's a good, uh, good point. So prior to my quant experience, I worked at a cryptocurrency exchange called BitMEX, which is located in Hong Kong. Uh, BitMEX was a great place to work. Everybody was very friendly. Uh, the company was very fun to work at initially at the beginning. Um, it became more of a bank than an actual place oriented around cryptocurrency and its tenants. But regardless, I thought, <clears throat> if you saw my resume, I did a rotational program where I worked on various different, uh, various different departments, like the financial products department, the venture capital department. And while I was doing those, while none of those positions actually required learning to code, I decided to pick up code because the language that they use is called Q. 
And I was like, what the hell is Q? None of my friends knew Q, nobody I knew knew Q. And so I felt that it wasn't as intimidating to learn a language that nobody else knew. So I decided to give it a run and I really liked it. I really wanted at the end of my rotation program, which lasted a couple of months or I was there for a couple of, I was there for maybe eight months before starting the rotation program. But regardless, at the end of the rotation program, they gave me a promotion to join the structured products team. I said, I don't want to do it. It's boring. My manager really didn't know what he was doing and he wasn't a leader in the team. He was, he had no leadership ability or real managerial strengths and he got nothing done. So I said, I don't want to join your team. I want to join the risk management team because I've become extremely proficient at programming in Q. And the risk manager, the risk management um, leader wanted me on his team. But all this office politics got in the way, all this office, you know, how dare you want to join another team, right? All that BS got in the way. And instead of actually taking on somebody that's passionate, interested, loves learning and is a quick learner, they decided, or well, I decided, or we both decided that I don't want to continue working at that firm anymore. And so I just left. Um, yeah. So. I got fired from BitMEX because I decided not to take a promotion. But at that point in time, I was already, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say it, I got fired from BitMEX because I did not want to take their promotion. And at that time, I already knew 100% in my, the bottom of my heart, I was going to become a programmer. I didn't give a shit if it was not going to be a BitMEX, I knew I was going to become a programmer because I rejected that offer, that promotion, knowing full well that they will probably fire me because I don't have a position at the company anymore. I rejected a promotion. I said, I don't want to work with this guy because he's a horrible leader. And so therefore I decided to accept anything that comes my way, which a firing came my way. And I didn't even look back. I walked out of that building, flew from Hong Kong to Toronto, locked myself in a room for three to four months, studied code for 12 hours a day, and ended up getting multiple job offers. Because when I put my mind to something, I'm going to slay it. I don't care what it is, it is going to be slain. So that's my story. That's my story about how I got into quant trading. I knew I loved finance. I gained a passion for trading, trading engines, um, risk management while working at BitMEX. And it's a shame. I could have been one of their top Q or KDB developers, but they decided that office politics, ego and face, saving face is much more important than actually valuing your employees and using their productive capabilities to better your organization. Super chat here, coding Jesus, can a self-taught trader and programmer build enough quality products and applications to speak out amongst those with formal degree? Absolutely yes, Chad, absolutely yes. You'd be surprised. You should watch my video about how to break into the world of quantitative trading as a trader. Over there, I discuss a lot about the skill set and the knowledge you need to break into the world of quantitative trading. And if you do have experience trading yourself and building out quality projects and applications, you can definitely, definitely break in as a junior, maybe even higher in terms of seniority. So yes, you can chat. And if you'd like to learn more, watch my videos. If you want a one-on-one -on -one session with me, email me, emails up here or down there, wherever, and we can go ahead and uh, book a one-on-one -on -one session. Do you think you were born with the ability to grind or you learned it? That's a really good question. I've never been the type of person to simply give up on problems. I just can't go to sleep. I can't go to sleep if there's a problem that I haven't solved or there's a concept that I don't, that I'm not familiar with. You know, if I don't know something at work, I will ask. I have no shame in saying I don't understand this. And I think that's, I think that's an admirable quality. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that it's a quality that a lot of software engineers need to have. Um, so yeah, I mean, I get it, it, a lot of it comes from your childhood. If your parents didn't raise you or your parents didn't, dis, didn't raise you with a mentality of, you know, working through problems, you know, if they gave you, if they, if they encourage shortcuts and quick fixes, then when you grow up, that's going to primarily be what you understand, shortcuts and quick fixes. Uh, what's your beard and hair routine? Just comb my hair when I shower. I mentioned that before. Um, beard is just some beard oil occasionally, I guess. Um, not, not more than that. I want a long beard, guys. I want it to be like up to like here. Like. Whew. 
What is your view on CQF? Guys, you're using a lot of antonyms or whatever they're called or type things out clearly because there are so many different meanings for the exact same, uh, not antonyms, shit. Maybe it's antonyms, I don't know. It's the shortening form of words. How to get into Jane Street? Good question. I applied, they didn't even give me an interview, but that was before I had any formal experience. And it's funny because I'm the 2020 Jane Street top puzzle solver and they still didn't even give me an interview. But let's put that behind us. Um, what's your work-life balance like as a quant developer? Great question and thank you for the super chat. Guys, you want your questions answered? Super chat, super chat, super chat. Acronyms, right, okay. Um, what is my work-life balance? It's great. It is great. You'd be very surprised. Um, I get into the office maybe at 8.30. I currently have, I currently lead a team of interns because it's the summer, so we have interns. Um, so I have a stand up with them at around nine for around 15 minutes to, uh, to half an hour. Um, I work, 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 write code, maybe write some documentation, maybe talk to the interns, help them out here and there. I have lunch. Lunch is great, everything's paid for. You order whatever you want from wherever you want it. You either eat on your desk or maybe you go outside for a walk and eat. Most people eat beside their desk. Uh, you then work, work, work. You might have a couple of meetings, and maybe a stand up in terms of your entire team. Um, you might walk around, grab some fresh air. I mean, nobody's gonna be breathing down your neck. The industry is all about performance, guys. It doesn't matter. You can work from home your whole life and still be a top developer. Um, and after you've done that, you um, you simply go home at five. You go home at five or 5.30 or maybe six. Maybe you go home and code up a little more if you want to, and if not, that's perfectly fine. I, I have boxing at 5.30 Tuesdays and Fridays, or Tuesdays and Saturdays, whenever I pick. So I go do boxing at 5.30. I sweat like a freaking pig. I come home, I shower. I then might work on like a little pet project that I have. I built a Monero transaction sniffer, so... Um, you know, I have a Twitter account that automatically posts um, non-conforming Monero transactions. Um, I read books, I do anything I want, um, and it's fun, and it's great, and you go for a run, and it's amazing. Tamil, 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 Ohana, Ohana, Makure Tamil, Mashlumcha. All right, we have a, a fellow Israeli, so I'm going to have to, to, to speak to Tamil first, so... What do you think about Polygon's potential? I haven't looked into Polygon. My friend previously worked at Polygon three years ago. As I understand it, Polygon helps facilitate um, companies ICOing. I don't know much about them to be frank. I'm sorry there. Uh, let's see here. Thoughts on Ivy or do you have criticisms to Queen apply to Ivy as well? Joshua wrong. Uh, Joshua, don't go to business school. I went to business school, don't do it. And guys, if you're joining now, make sure to get my likes up. Likes up, 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 we need the likes up if we wanna help this channel grow. Uh, don't go to business school, it was my biggest regret. And it's funny because I wouldn't be here today if I didn't go to business school, but at the same time, if I can do it all again, I would simply not go to business school. Uh, guys, in 20 years, if you can't code, you're gonna have a very hard time finding a job. A very, very hard time finding a job. This is the direction the future is heading. Guys, 300 years ago, nine out of 10 people were farmers. Now one, less than one out of a thousand people are farmers. The world's moving towards AI, uh, coding, programming. So don't, uh, don't go to business school. And even if you say, even if you say, um, you know, I have known nothing about code, I don't care. Sign up for a computer science program, do it. You'll learn a lot there, you'll learn to code there. Learn a bit in the summer, you will be totally fine, okay? Learn to code, uh, it's gonna be very important. How old are you? You look really young. I don't remember how old I am. Uh, two couple of thousand years old, I think that's about right. Um, collab with Dimitri Bianco, I don't know who he is. Make him send, have him send me an email. Guys, you want your super, your answers, questions answered, super chat. Farzan Hashmi, thank you for the super chat. For quant roles, how much should I grind lead code? That's very important. It actually is very important. I did 300 lead codes before, I did 200 lead codes before I felt comfortable. And by the time I had a job offer, I had 300 lead codes under my belt. So what well, lead codes are very important, despite the fact that um, at work, you're not going to be writing your own sorting functions, lead code are still very important. Am I Israeli? Yes, I'm Israeli. 
I am Israeli. Hey, what are your thoughts on masters in financial engineering? It all depends on your background, who you are, what you've done previously. If you're currently in computer science and you have a degree and you have a job and you're fine as a quantitative developer, there's no need in doing that. Um, it all depends what you want to do, what you want to apply for. Put it in the super chat and flesh out the question and I'll answer it. Why do you think bosses in these hedge funds don't have the ability to code? Is this just a time factor and in the next 10 to 20 years, all bosses will be those who code like you? This is a good question. Um, the roles are different. The roles are applying for are different. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying every single person out there will need to code, but the amount of work that will be available for people that don't know how to code will be substantially lower. You'll still have your grocery clerks and you'll still have whoever, and then you'll have the tech and AI class of people that know how to do that. Um, there are a group of people in these places like Jump Trading that are portfolio managers. And in Jump Trading, for example, you'll have separate teams that each work against each other in the same firm. So Jump Trading is like a venture capital firm that seeds each one of these portfolio managers with money. They have them compete against each other. And these portfolio managers manage their own P&L and they rent the quantitative developer services. So they rent quant infrastructure in order to facilitate their trading strategies, which I find really weird because at the organization that I work at, everybody works and collaborates with each other. The quant team collaborates with the quant dev team, which collaborates with the quant trading team. There's no, there's no contention here. There's no silos. But in a lot of these trading firms, you guys, you'd be really surprised. They have teams in the organization that fight against each other for meat and teams that yeah, te that's crazy. Yeah, teams that don't do well will die off and teams that do well will continue to grow and they'll accumulate resources. And while they accumulate resources, they will then um, rent services from the quant devs, which is sounds insane to me. It's like having this ar my arm competing against my other arm. How does that work? It's like having my heart compete against my liver. To me, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I get the idea behind it that you want jump trading wants its portfolio managers to, you know, to, to have some sort of evolutionary condition by which they all compete and they all then the best rise to the top. But um, it seems a little a little strange to me actually. Survival of the fittest. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Oh, Tom Tom Pret, thank you for the super chat. How many quant traders know how to code, know enough Python or C++ to test their trading strategies? Quant researchers are the guys that really know how to test their trading strategies because they're the guys writing the strategies and been thinking of the strategies. Quant traders will use data per se to develop tools that they might use in trading. They might build simple backtesting uh, algorithms but they won't have like a super detailed understanding of Python. They will have a rudimentary understanding of how to grab data from here and display it here. Now, of course, the more code you know as a quant trader, the more likely you are to stand out from your peers. But when you're looking at kind of the baseline quant traders knowledge in Python, it's either non-existent or they do have some understanding of Python, but they use it to manipulate data to help them make better data driven decisions and display information. Now, of course, as a software engineer, my role is to do that for a trader, to be able to build these server client uh, applications to display these things for traders. But you know, I might be busy working on something and a trader wants to whip something up real quick. So he will go and utilize Python and hit some sort of uh, database endpoint and grab the data he wants and start thinking about his strategy in terms of data. Hopefully does that makes sense, Tom Pret. Thank you for the super chat. Why do you believe there aren't as many females in the industry? That's a good question. And any answer that I give will get me immediately canceled. So, so there is no right answer here. It's like when your wife asks you, do I look fat in this dress? There is no right answer. So I'm not going to, uh, to answer that question. What percent of retail or day traders do you believe actually make money over the long term? And what edge do you think they have that actually allows them to succeed? So, I believe in the efficient market hypothesis, which pretty much postulates that you cannot in the long term make consistent alpha by fundamental or technical analysis. So there might be these traders that make money one or two years. I do not believe in the long term that they will be able to make money consistently. And given that current markets are semi-strong, leaning towards strong efficient, the only way to truly make money by simply picking stocks is to have insider information as to which stocks you pick. 
right? Uh, that's the only way in my mind, right? There are obviously quantitative methods to do so, but when we're talking about retail or day traders or even the Warren Buffett people, there is no way unless you're insider trading. And Warren Buffett doesn't simply pick stocks. He sits on boards and he has insider, not insider information, but he has insider privilege in the sense that, you know, companies offer him perks or preferred special preferred shares for joining their board because it adds credibility to their company. So Warren Buffett doesn't simply pick Coca-Cola because it looks nice and he read its balance sheet. No, Coca-Cola will give him preferred shares that will give him certain privileges and certain benefits that will help him make more money. Do quant firms have SRE team set reliability engineers? Um, I don't think so. They have DevOps people that focus on market data connectivity, that, you know, traditional, uh, you know, firms that have their own front end website or sites might not have. They have a DevOps team that focus on networking. Uh, the DevOps team is, is much different. There's no site reliability. I haven't seen a site reliability engineer. When you think about it, what, what do trading firms do in terms of DevOps? They build applications that need to be deployed on the trader's side. So for example, front end tools that traders will use. They have soft, they have uh, server side applications that are communicating with these clients that traders use. And they have um, special algorithms that run in an autonomous fashion that are distinct from what the traders are doing um, that might be co-hosted, co-located in some sort of data center. So there isn't much site reliability work here. Um, and like I said, while the automated algorithms are separate from what the traders are doing, traders can control them and set parameters to, to um, adjust to market dynamics. Can you wish my friend Nick Gurr a happy birthday? Thanks for the super chat, Peter Griffin. Yes, Nick, happy birthday from Coding Jesus. Uh, is it better to look for a day trading job, look for trading jobs in EU or UK? UK, UK is a financial hub of the EU, definitely. Uh, in Amsterdam, flow traders are there. There is a flow traders in Amsterdam. Um, but yeah, I would look. Uh, I would look for the UK. Any more questions, guys? Super chats. We're just going off here. All the quant dev stuff. We finished the resume stuff. Remember to like this video, guys, to really help me out. And um, that's free. So hopefully everybody's done that. And if you really want to help me out, super chats will be great. Patreon link, d contribute, crypto, whatever you want. Oh, thank you for the super chat here. Overkill to override. You've been here for a long time. Thanks for watching. Is it possible to move up in a quant research role from a quant developer? Yeah, it's possible. I wouldn't see why not. You have to show a proficiency in Python um, and mathematical, uh, have, a math, have a background in math, math or statistics. And um, it's definitely possible. I think the more you move up in quantitative development, the less you work with traders and the more you work with the quant researchers because the senior devs are responsible for implementing the trading strategies or the pseudo code or the Python code that the quant researchers will come up with. And you really don't want to get that thing, those things wrong. So you want to make sure that you're doing it right, which is why that's usually given to the senior developers. Coding Jesus, where are you from? Israel. I am from Israel. Ethnically, uh, my great grandparents are on both sides are from Yemen, the poorest country in the Middle East. Law no. Why are people saying LMFAO? I don't. Law no law. CJ no. What, what, CJ no what? Law law law. I don't know what people are lolling about. Um. At the moment, it seems that all cryptocurrencies are moving together and being treated as a single entity. Do you ever see a moment in the future where? Will deep couple behave independently? I have a unique take, I think, on cryptocurrency and the future of cryptocurrency in terms of where I see it. Why is everybody saying CJ no? I don't, I don't get, you guys are just trolling me. I don't get why you're saying CJ no. Oh, am I slow? Am I slowing down? No, I'm not slow. You guys are trolling me right now. Um, I'm gonna make a video about this, but in general, I see a world of competing cryptocurrencies. I see a world where people are using different currencies throughout their day. Not 10 different currencies, maybe two to three, maybe four or five currencies at most. You guys need to stop trolling me. CJ, don't do it. I don't know what you're talking about. 
Somebody time out this bad guy. Uh, I don't know why he's <laughs> saying CJ no. Uh, C++ and Python are quant languages. Yes, C, uh, depends on what you mean by quant. There's quant trading, quant dev, quant research. Like I said, quant research, primarily Python, MATLAB, R, quant dev, C++, and one of these two languages, either C Sharp or Python, and then trading, uh, Python, or pretty much Python, if you're, if you're going to be a trader that knows how to code. Oh, I got trolled. Oh no. Oh no, Nick. Nick Gurr. Oh man, I got trolled. Nick. <laughs> it did, yeah, okay. It didn't sound like the bad word. We'll, we'll keep that off here. Um, no, you're helping me, Bab. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Why do some positions require a PhD in mathematics? They don't. I don't know where people are getting PhD. They don't. They say an equivalent degree in math, computer science. Um, yeah. It, Nick, I get, I, guys, I get it. I, I get what he was trying to do. It that doesn't really sound like the actual word that he's trying to, trying to, uh, trying to make me say. Um, what languages do you speak? I speak, um, I speak Hebrew, Mandarin, Chinese, and English. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, Joe Blow, if you have to convince someone that the market is efficient, do you have a preferred mathematical proof or reason that best illustrates it? Uh, there are people a lot smarter than me that have done work with hundreds of different papers that have all shown that the market is semi-strong, leaning towards strong, efficient. Uh, I have links in the description of my video titled Why I Don't Do Technical Analysis, Why Technical Analysis is Garbage, that describe it. Uh, it isn't per se mathematical truth, rather it's axioms about the financial world, and it also, and they also, I'm assuming, go into uh, mathematical proofs as well. Um, so yeah, it's research using a tons of different data points. I don't have one off the top of my head here. Um, but yeah, there are people a lot smarter than me that have come to these conclusions. They are well off, well researched, well studied conclusions. Mandarin is Chinese. Mandarin is Chinese. <sighs> Mandarin is Chinese. Chinese is Chinese. Uh, Chinese is Chinese. Chinese is Chinese. Chinese is Chinese. Chinese is Chinese. So when you say Chinese, you either have. Um, you either have um, regular Mandarin, which is the spoken standard Mandarin language, or you have um, Baihua. Baihua is like the Guangdong province dialect, which is very, very popular and used in places like Hong Kong. Can Ethereum be what everybody wanted Bitcoin to be? No, it will never be what people wanted Bitcoin to be. Bitcoin isn't what people wanted Bitcoin to be. Uh, Ethereum is completely different than what Bitcoin is, and it's targeting a different niche, a different problem, etc. Wait, uh, is she told she needs but data science, but technion, not technion, echli frots, but that she a quantum. Um, how did you learn Mandarin? Oh, I studied Mandarin Chinese for six years. I still have classes once every week. Um, I still have classes once every week. I do Mandarin. World Quant University MA MFE program. Any opinion for job? I don't know what that is. Is it easy to break into quant rules that don't code and use platforms like Bloomberg, Fact? There will be no quant trading role out there where you won't be using your firm's proprietary trading software. You're going to be using their front ends, their clients, everything that's theirs. Um, so they, they do use Bloomberg. They might read Bloomberg headlines via the Bloomberg API before it even pops up on your screen. But uh, no, nobody uses Bloomberg to backtest their, I don't even think you can backtest an idea on Bloomberg. 
There is no solution to ransomware attacks. I don't think there is. All right, guys, we're going to do 10 minutes more. This has been two around two hours and 10 minutes. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it, but we're going to do 10 minutes more because I'm really starving. 10 minutes more. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, question session has been like 30 minutes so far. You know what? It's been 30 minutes. I think the chat's slowing down, guys. I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody that's come out here. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed talking to everybody. I enjoyed talking about the chat. Most importantly, I enjoyed talking about building a resume. So church is over, guys. We've been at church for two hours. Thank you for coming. Thank you for everybody that's tied to the Church of Coding Jesus, donated Monero, PayPal, Nano, whatever. Bitcoin, I don't accept those donations. Um, so thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming and watching. Um, I really enjoy this. I'm hoping to make this more frequent, to make this a part of the Coding Jesus channel. I also think that's a place that I can differentiate myself from other YouTube and content creators because I am, uh, because they don't do live streams and they don't answer your questions live. And yeah, maybe I might get trolled a little, that's okay. We'll live through it. Um, that's part of being an online figure, I guess. Um, but what I really enjoy is the laughter, the banter, um, the good faith banter here. Um, just speaking to people, the resumes, the emails, it's all great. Thank you guys so much for coming out. And without further ado, I'm going to end the live stream. Have a great day, guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Church is now officially not in session. Here, see you guys.